Hello, good evening and welcome. Thank you very much for coming tonight on the uh, terrible evening of uh, awful Manchester weather. My name's Philip Duval. I'm the current chair of Equality Northwest, uh, a local group affiliated to the National Equality Trust, the organisation inspired by the spirit level. Um, I'm particularly uh, pleased to welcome David Malone back this evening. Uh, I've learned a tremendous amount from David over the last year, and I think there's several thousand other people who would probably say the same. Um, I think it's vital for those of us who want to live in a more equal society, understand what is happening with the debt crisis. Uh, not least because Japan, which started down the bank bailout road 20 years ago, has probably only survived as a society because it's so equal. So, um, I think, as I say, it's really important for us to understand just whose debts we are, we are paying for. So, with no further ado, David Thank Malone. You. Thank you, Philip. Um, the title of the talk this evening is um, A Tale of Two Currencies, uh, because, as Phil said, it is important, I think, if you want to understand why we are bailing out the banks and what austerity measures are for, um, we have to understand something about the currencies that we use. The, the Yesterday I spoke to um, the controller of BBC4, a ferociously intelligent man, very well read, very well informed, absolutely nobody's fool. And he said to me, but, but surely we, we have to pay off the, the debts that we owe. Now, it just struck me. He's nobody's fool. He's a tremendously well informed man. And yet, that was the question he was stuck on. And it made me think, really, the reason that he's stuck on it is because hidden in that question is a mistake, which is that why are we having to pay off the debts we owe? It's assuming that the debts we're paying off by bailing out the banks and by all these austerity measures are our debts, the, the debts that we owe. That's, that is the mantra of the mainstream. It's what our governments tell us, it's what the media tells us, it's certainly what the banks tell us. But is it the case? Are we paying off our debts? And I don't think we are. At least that's what I'm going to try to convince you of. And to understand it, what I want to argue is that in this country, and in fact in all countries where the debt banking crisis happened, there are two currencies. There's the currency that we're all used to, the one that's printed up by the government, the one that you get paid in. Um, but there is another currency. I mean, that's money, right? That's what we get paid in. However, it's not the only currency that we use. Your mortgage is part of an entirely different currency. <coughs> Sometime in the 80s, the banks essentially mutated what money is and what debt is. Um, they did it by something called securitization, which I'll, I'll explain very briefly. But basically, what I want to tell you is that the banks have created their own currency, one that they print up one that they are in control of, that operates quite differently to ours. Now, this is something that people like me were saying back in 2007, 2008, and we were generally shouted down and told we didn't know what we were talking about. Um, just a, a couple of months ago, there's a paper came out of the IMF called <coughs> something like um, the Chicago Solution Revisited. There's no reason why you should be familiar of it, with it, but it excited a lot of us because essentially this paper coming from within the IMF said what we'd been saying, said there are two currencies. So suddenly something which we were all told we were this fool that we should run along back home and stop meddling where we didn't understand. Suddenly here were people in the IMF saying, oh, actually, no, that, that's the case. The figures I'm going to give you are out of date, but they're the best figures I've got. These come from the 90s, they come from America. All right? In the 90s, I forget which, I think it was 98, there was about $1.6 trillion in this kind of money. Right? But there was 
58.4 trillion dollars in bank created money. In other words, the vast bulk of the wealth denominated in dollars was had not been issued by the US Treasury in this form. Now, there, the, that kind of disparity is the same here and it's the same in most European countries. I don't have those figures simply because European countries and Britain are very, very much better at obscuring the data that you want to get hold of. The Americans are really quite amateurish at it. Um, I don't think that they're deeply honest. I just think that it's a very big organisation and some idiot always manages to write down the number that they'd rather you didn't know. Whereas here we're much better at making sure that nobody does that. Um, all right, I want to prove to you that there, there really are two currencies. All right. It is a piece of paper, is it not? <coughs> paper with a high content of rag. Is it worth anything as a bit of paper? Is it? What do you think? No. Is it worth something as money? Yeah, it's worth five quid. If I then told you, actually, I printed this up this morning, what's it worth? I told you it's counterfeit. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So what makes it money? It says on here, I promise to pay the bearer. <coughs> That's the key. It's a promissory note. It says, if you accept this as payment for your labour or for something that you've given me, there's a promise that you can redeem this. Now, in the gold standard days, you could go to the Bank of England and the idea was you could say, give me five quid's worth of gold. And some Victorian gent would grudgingly hand it over. It's a long time since that was the case. What is the promise now? The promise is really very simple but critical. You know, you've all heard this phrase, the uh, lender of last resort. You know, we were always talking about that. The lender of last resort, they must lend. Actually, that's quite misleading. Um, the central banks aren't the lender of last resort. They're really the buyer of last resort. What it really means is that promise is, in the, in the end, the Bank of England would always accept this from you as payment. <coughs> They'll always make sure that you won't get left with a worthless bit of paper. Right? Because the essence of money is, you give me something valuable. Right? You've got a pig and you sell it to me. All right? And all I give you is a bit of paper. That's a bit of a raw deal. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and we'll be right back after these messages. <laughs> I'm going to have to get this. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> oh, and we're back. <laughs> now you're messing with me. <laughs> What you, the, the only reason that this stuff works, the only reason you accept it, that you'll give me something that you've made or something that you have that I want or that you will work for me is because you believe that someone else will accept this from you. If you didn't believe that, then you, you sure as hell wouldn't hand over something valuable for a bit of paper, which is why when I said it's counterfeit, you said, <laughs> no, no, no thanks, it's a bit of paper. The only difference between my counterfeit bit of paper and the real bit of paper is that promise. You know, you have faith that you won't get stuck with this as a worthless bit of paper. You'll be able to pass it on. Okay, that's real money. Now let's just say that this is bank money. All right? Bank money is essentially the same thing. I want you to think about a mortgage. What is the key thing on a mortgage? It's your promise to pay it back. I promise to pay. It's almost the same language. Right? The problem with mortgages is every one of them is unique. It's a different person. It's a different house. It's a different amount. That's not like money at all. It's like having a random selection of completely different denomination coins. What securitization did, and I won't go into the technicalities of it, but basically they took all of those individual mortgages, which are dead ends, because no one's going to accept it as payment, because they're all completely different. And they said, right, we'll chop them up. We'll take 100 mortgages, we'll chop them up to 100 pieces, and we'll put one piece from each one in 100 different parts. Okay? And by that seeming bit of craziness, you end up with all the mortgages being present in all of the different pots, the different securities, to an equal amount. Why is that important? Easy. 
when, when you take out 100 mortgages, when a bank gives them out, it is just the statistical probability that, let's say, 2% will not be paid back. It's the same statistics that underpin life, life assurance tables. They know that one of you is going to die of a, being struck by an anvil lorry, and another one's going to get it taken away by, um, by aliens. And they just know this. All right? And it's the same with mortgages. I, I'm, I'm picking 2% out of the air, but 2% of the mortgages that they give out won't get paid back. All right? If you were asking someone to accept a mortgage as a form of payment, then 2% of the people that accepted it from you would get nothing. That's not good, is it? But by chopping it up, then that 2%, those two mortgages out of 100 that will default, that loss is now equally distributed amongst the 100 securities, right? Because they chopped them all up into 100 pieces and dealt them out. So now there is no longer the possibility that if you accept a mortgage from the bank as payment, that you might get one of the two, which is worth nothing. Because that loss, which statistically will happen, is now distributed evenly amongst the 100 securities. Suddenly, the vagaries of mortgages not being paid back has disappeared. That turns something that's worthless and you can't pile, use as money into something you can. There is now no possibility you might get stuck with something worthless because the loss is already built into the securities. That step turned what had been essentially a dead-end agreement between a bank and an individual into something that could be used as money. And they did use it as money. Now, the bankers don't like this. They don't like this idea. Or rather, they don't like you hearing about it. But it is true because those mortgages, the banks used as collateral for loans. They use them to give as collateral to the central bank to get loans. They loan them to each other. They use them in all kinds of ways which make them money by any other name. You could ask, well, why do they bother? I mean, what's wrong with just our money? I mean, it's perfectly good money. Why do they need their own? Well, there's a flippant answer and a more serious answer. The flippant answer is that, go back to those figures, 1.6 trillion of, of dollars, like that, 58.4 of theirs. The bankers couldn't get as rich as they currently are if they could only divide up 1.6 trillion between them. They want to be richer than that. Being less flippant, banks chafed at being, having to grow quite slowly and be limited by that. By this magic of securitization of turning debt into a currency, they could have as much as they wanted. All right, now the less flippant part. Let me give you a quote, which I'm, you're probably all familiar with, um, from Mayor Rothschild. 1863, half of you will know this immediately. Give me control of a nation's money, and I care not who makes its laws. And the truth of that must be abundantly obvious to us all now. Okay? The reason the banks, I'm not saying it's the, what they had in mind when they invented securitization, I don't believe there was a, there's been a 40 year conspiracy. But I think once they'd invented it, and it was, a, in many ways, a good invention, they suddenly, I think somebody at some point went, hang on. Instead of having to wait for some politician to say, let's increase the amount of money by printing up 10 million pounds or 20 billion dollars, instead of doing that, every time we issue a mortgage, every time we create a debt, and someone signs on the dotted line saying, I promise to pay you back, we're, in essence, creating our own money. We are increasing the money supply. And they did. Take you back to those figures. One point, what was it? One point six trillion dollars. And they add, in 20 years, nearly 59 trillion of their own. Nations do not control the amount of money in the world or even in their own countries. They simply do not. They can control how much of this stuff gets printed. But the ratio of 1.6 to 59 means they could stop printing this altogether. And it would be trillions. They do not control that. Do you remember in the 80s when we used to, the news was constantly about M1 and M3 and MZ and 
they talked about the money supply. Have you noticed how they don't anymore? It's not on the news anymore. It would never pass a politician's lips. Why? Because they don't control it anymore. So they don't want to talk about it anymore. Banks control it. So they create their own currency. <sighs> Once you've got your own con currency, we're with Mr. Rothschild, aren't we? They do control the currency. Basically, to paraphrase him, money is power. Okay? But if money is power, then I would say debt is power plus interest. <laughs> and that's the land we live in now. Okay? But now let's think about what you the relationship of the money that you have and the banks have. What I mean is, what is your money tied up in? What kind of money? Well, you get paid in this stuff, don't you? <coughs> this is the money that our lives revolve around, our, our worth is tied up in. But we know from those figures, this is not really the important money for banks, is it? This is about 2% of the money that the banks have. The other 98% is a different currency altogether. Okay, hang on to that, please. All right. Now let's think about what happened to the two currencies. And if you disagree with me, stick your hand up, because I don't want to go on and on if people are going, hang on, I don't get that at all. But if you accept that there really are two currencies, let's think about what happened. You think about what the banks are always saying, the, the great danger. We mustn't let governments print. Printing will all end up like Weimar or Germany or Zimbabwe. Right? And governments, you can't trust them. They're always going to print up money willy-nilly and we'll all be paupers and living in a ditch with poo on our head. And yet while they've been telling us that, they have been printing up money like drunken fools. How can I say that? What well, easy. What do you think subprime is? They issued mortgages to people who could pay it back. They ran out of those people and they said, I want my bank to grow bigger. I, I want more money. I want another Lamborghini. So they started issuing mortgages to people who couldn't really afford it. But they said, trust me, I'm a banker. Which means they started issuing more and more of their money. They printed it up. Not only did they print it up by issuing debt, issuing more bits of paper which said, I promise to pay it back. But then they did things like they used that money as collateral for borrowing money from another bank. When the banks created securities, they would sell them. They would sell them to other financial institutions. They would keep some themselves, always kept some themselves, sold it to others. The ones they kept themselves, they then went to another bank saying, can I have a loan, mate? And banks, and I have to take a brief pause here, banks don't lend out money on the basis of the deposits in the bank. When, you go, when, when IBM says, can I have a loan, Mr. Goldman Sachs, Mr. Goldman doesn't say to Mr. Sachs, boy, Sachs, nip in the back, see how much money we've got on deposit? And he goes to the big vault and says, well, we haven't got enough. That's not how it works. That's how it works in Hollywood, old Hollywood films, like It's a Wonderful Life. It's not how it works in reality. When a bank wants to lend money, it simply writes the amount that it's going to lend in the ledger, and it's done. They create money out of thin air. Right? All they have to worry about is, at the end of the day, the government official says, how much capital have you got in the bank, which underpins this. And it doesn't, it's not one-to-one. -one. That's fractional banking says, if I lend out a fiver... I don't have to have a fiver on deposit somewhere. B because I can actually lend out maybe a hundred quid on the basis of that fiver. How? You're thinking, well, how is that? He's just making money out of nothing. Well, I couldn't if I actually had to hand over five pound notes because I've only got the one, haven't I? But I don't. I, I just credit your account. Mm -hmm. All right? And the reason I can hand out lots of them on the basis of one fiver is the same logic as you find in life assurance. Right? Life insurance companies say, well, we'll insure all of these people because the chances are we're only going to have to pay out for two of them. That's how insurance works, isn't it? 
That's how banking works too. They can lend out that fiver a hundred times because they think we've worked out the chances of someone actually coming in saying we want that fiver now is about 1%. Okay? The reason I t took that little detour is because the banks basically devalued their own currency. They debased their currency. In other words, they're creating a currency. And at one point it was based on debts, good mortgages to people who would pay them back. In a way, that's, that's gold. That's a solid gold coin. Once they start selling mortgages to people who probably can't pay back, that's like mixing a little bit of tin into the gold. Right? And eventually, you can, send, you can um, make debts to people who really aren't going to pay back. And I've seen the files, I've seen the facts and the figures that were shown to me by people in Cleveland in America, where the person who was signing more than one mortgage, when I met her, she was homeless. But the lawyer arranging it didn't care, and he was getting his, and the, and the bank, and then it was all sold off to Deutsche Bank, who didn't care either. And I, I'm not making that up. I can, show you the, I can show you the files. He was very keen to show me because he wanted to get this story out. I mean, and that was just one city. Right? It's happened all over the place. Basically, they start pouring all... They're not making gold bars anymore. They're doing what every tin pot lunatic in history has ever done. They just get lots of tin, and then they think, we've got to make it look a bit like gold, haven't we? So they get someone to insure it, you know, which is the um, uh, CDS. Um, credit default swaps. And basically, it's this form of insurance that says if someone doesn't pay back what the security says they will, I'll insure it and I'll pay you the full amount. That's all that CDSs are. But that's just a, a bar of tin, a plug of nickel, with a little tiny painting of gold on the outside. Not only did they do that, so that is the base of the currency, but then they do things like hypothecation or rehypothecation, words that we never even knew a few years ago. Rehypothecation is fantastic. And it happens a lot. Rehypothecation, if I've got a security, I bought it, it's mine, I can hypothecate it to another bank. And because I've hypothecated it to them, they can claim that this is an asset of theirs. However, it never actually leaves my bank. But they have a claim on it, is what it's called legally. And more fantastically, with that claim, not the actual thing, just a claim on it, they can rehypothecate it to somebody else. And now three banks have a claim on this thing. It's only in my bank, but three that do. So the financial system has grown by a multiple of three, but the actual value, the actual goal, the actual content hasn't grown at all. All the banks decide to do this one day. How did it? I Good mean, question. If, if that's a big, big. Well, I mean, it sounds as though suddenly all the banks. Did one bank think of it? Did the other support it? Um, I don't know the answer. I, I don't know the answer for, for hypothecation or rehypothecation. I mean, London is no, I really. Mean, the whole, this whole shebang, these two currencies that you're talking about. Um, well, uh, securitization started in America. Right. Okay. Um, I think it was actually a Brit working. For, I could have this wrong, but I think he was working for, for JP Morgan. But I'm not sure. Um, and it was a good idea in, in, in the sense that it, it did spread out the risk amongst a, a lot of securities and you, you could then use it and there are many positives to it but like the Sorcerer's Apprentice in the hands of a cretin which a lot of people on Wall Street are it gets out of hand they, they were so thrilled um, because Oh, we'll take another slight detour since you've raised it. In old-fashioned banking, when you lent me money as a bank, you had to decide, was I really going to pay it back? Yeah? yeah. All right? You're the bank manager, I come in, mm, please, and you go, what are your prospects? What, who do you work for? You know, well, you know, the kind of things that my parents, even my parents' day, were still... I, I, okay. Yes, <laughs> still, yes, yes, <laughs> you went to see the bank manager, you're in fear and trembling, because he might say no, and that was you stuffed. Yeah. And the reason that the bank manager was so careful is because it was the bank's money and the only way you were going to get that back is if I really was going to be employed for the next 30 years and really was going to pay you back. Once you get securitization, that risk is gone from your bank. You've sold it. It's now in security which you've sold to another bank. So do you care whether I pay it back or not? 
do you hell? Of course you don't. Because if I don't pay it back, it's not going to reflect badly on you. It's some Herbert who bought it in, in, in Frankfurt. Yeah. Which is actually what happened. Yeah. The German land banks bought up as much uh, American securities as they could. I talked to a banker in Ireland who said to me, who was working for a German bank, since that's where they all did the, the dirty deeds, he said, the, the German banks would buy it before the ink was dry on the contract. And so that's where a lot of it is, in the German banks. And just one more historical thing. Yeah. If you borrowed it from a mutual building society, yeah. your mortgage is different. Well, it wouldn't be securitised. So it was an old-fashioned mortgage. It was an old-fashioned mortgage. Which, then what happened in the <coughs> 80s and 90s to all of those? Thank you. Why? Because banking in the old-fashioned way is slow, isn't it? Yeah. You've got to sit there, looking very august, but waiting for someone to come in who you know, answers all the questions that you want them to, and then you lend them out some money. And then you wait 30 years to get it back. Your bank will grow slowly. Very safe, very slow. Think of RBS. It was a small Scottish bank. In the 80s, it went boom! How the hell did it do that? It went from nothing to global, bestriding the world, which was great for the people in charge, wasn't it? At one point, they were a small, obscure Scotsman in charge of a small, obscure Scottish bank. And the next minute, they were striding around Europe saying, that Dutch bank, ABM Manbro, I'll buy it. Don't bother wrapping it, I shall take it with me. <laughs> <laughs> so they loved it. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, during that time, when they were growing hugely, they were growing hugely because they were printing up their money like nobody's business, while at the same time appearing on Newsnight saying, wagging the finger at, at, at um, politicians and cautioning everyone not to trust politicians because, well, these people can't be trusted. Before you know it, they'll be printing up thousand-pound notes and we'll all be having to wheel home you know, our, our earnings in a wheelbarrow. And yet, they were doing precisely that with their own... Yeah, Joe. Just a point, David. Yeah. I'm, I'm, forgive me if I'm trying to correct you. No, no, carry on, mate. I don't mean you know, a ton of respect for it. But when you say they were printing up money, they weren't printing money. They were crediting money. To yeah, back okay, I'm using it. Exactly. I'm, I'm using it in that, in that. All I'm trying to do is show you that although the language that, that everyone uses would make them sound very different, they're actually the same process. They're increasing the money supply. And they're doing it in ways they, the bankers, were doing to their money supply the things which they cautioned nations should never do. Yes? What about credit card debt? Where does that come into it? It's the same thing. It's the it's same thing same as thing. it's the same kind of. They that as well? Yes. Okay. And student loans yeah. and anything else. And in fact, there has been a big push in the last five years to find things to securitize. Because it is what I call the undead heart of the banking system. It's stone cold dead, but it hammers away, and it's what makes the global banking system work. And basically, it had a massive cardiac arrest in 2008. And they've been pumping it like this ever since to get the monster to come to life again. And they really would. And they are, with the help of a few clever people. <laughs>